Friends in the audience, I declare that there is a freedom for your soul that comes from God. Wherever you live or whatever you have done, you can be free. We have a divine right of freedom. God wants us to be free, and we're actually in a season of freedom celebrations. A lot of attention has recently been focused on the 4th of July. Perhaps this is the most famous festival reminding all Americans about our precious heritage of liberty. But July is really a very big month for independence. The 1st of July is Canada Day, calling to remembrance the day in 1867 when Canadians gained home rule from England. Bastille Day is July 14th, marking the date in 1789 when France broke free from the rule of monarchy. July the 10th commemorates Independence Day in the Bahamas, and you know what they say about that, don't you? It's better in the Bahamas. <laughs> well, that is not quite true when it comes to celebrating freedom. Many nations commemorate their versions of Independence Day, but few have the spark, flair, or sheer energy of America. We do freedom right. And there's a good reason for that. America has truly set the standard for liberty. Some question if America is too free. Personal liberty sometimes conflicts with the interests of civil order. Nevertheless, American freedom has been the envy of oppressed people and the worst fear of their oppressors everywhere. Perhaps this is why America, along with the great coalition of other freedom-loving democratic allies, have fought to help others enjoy liberty. As a Jewish believer in a Jewish Messiah, my perspective is undoubtedly a little different than many other Christian ministers. Usually I try and help non-Jews learn about the Jewish connection to early Christianity. I also enjoy informing believers about the biblical festivals of Judaism that provide such a rich heritage for all of the faithful. And today I think it will be fun to do both as we focus a little more attention on America's celebration of freedom. In a nutshell, at the heart of the American Revolution was a tale of two kings. Our forefathers chose to trust in the King of Kings above the King of England. One king willingly left his throne to purchase mankind's freedom at a place called Calvary. The other loved his throne in England more than his subjects in the colonies. Both kings paid a price. One shed his own blood, the other shed an armies. It took a cross to set us free from bondage to sin, but it would take a bloody revolution to break the bondage of England. In retrospect, the, the need for America to break free from the rule of England's King George uh, appears obvious. But in 1776, it was impossible to have known the outcome of such a revolt. In a previous episode, I asked, do you know the difference between a revolt and a revolution? Well, if you look in the dictionary, you'll find that revolt comes before revolution. But revolts are not usually classified as revolutions until they're won. Before George Washington issued a call to arms and led our troops to victory, becoming America's greatest hero and first president, no one knew how the history books would later tell his story. Had we lost the war, our role models would have been very different. George Washington couldn't tell a lie and is revered as the father of our nation whereas Benedict Arnold couldn't tell the truth. Yet if England had won the war, the most famous American traitor might have been England's greatest hero. The American family has a great story to tell. Do you know the one about Uncle Sam? Nothing symbolizes America quite like our good old Uncle Sam. He's been with us since the early 1800s. The best information suggests that the real Uncle Sam was a man named Samuel Wilson. He supplied large amounts of meat to the newly formed United States Army. He stamped all of his shipping crates for the government with the famous initials U.S. 
as you might guess. Someone jokingly suggested the, abbre the abbreviation stood for Uncle Sam Wilson, and the nickname stuck. Uncle Sam came to symbolize the federal government. Now, we know that the image we have come to love did not look like the original Uncle Sam Wilson. You see, he was clean shaven, and that just wouldn't do for America's uncle. The caricature with a white beard and the image of Uncle Sam, as we know him, is credited to a 19th century political cartoonist named Thomas Nast. He gave us the star-spangled, red, white, and blue suited drawing that has become an enduring symbol of American identity. He's also an icon of American unity recognized around the world. However, he did not show up on the American scene until a few years after our revolution, and that's a good thing. Uncle Sam may have been embarrassed by colonial America's lack of unity toward our war for independence. I want to explain a little more about the division and lack of support for the idea of a revolution, but first it's important to focus on our symbols. Uncle Sam became a symbol of freedom. Symbols can unify a people and help us get behind the, the greatest causes. Somehow, sometimes, to understand a big picture, we need a powerful symbol. The big picture can be difficult to grasp, but once obtained, it is easy to enjoy. Some ideas, like freedom, are so big that they cannot be contained in a static document. They outgrow the pages where they were envisioned and require broader forms of expression to capture the sentiment. Often, mankind's greatest ideas are best expressed in the art or music of those touched by the idea. Great songs, great poetry, great imagery, architecture, and artwork often tell the immortal stories that words alone might leave untold. Certain transcendent ideas need a supporting cast of heroes who've been challenged and changed by the concepts themselves. Freedom must have a face to best express the characteristics embodied in the idea of liberty. Once identified, a great concept like freedom takes on a life of its own. It becomes recognizable as an eternal truth worth any cost to protect. Why else would anyone die for an idea? Yet freedom is a concept for which many have died. And American freedom has been birthed at such a deep level of our national psyche that even our greatest and most enduring heroes are best understood as symbols of that freedom. I'm glad that one of our heroes is genuinely larger than life. Have you met what is certainly one of our greatest symbols of freedom? Please allow me to introduce you in just a moment. And by the way, yes, you can thank a Jew. Perhaps freedom is best symbolized by that great older woman known as the Mother of Exiles. Have you ever met her? Let me tell you her story. In 1883, a woman from a New York family of Sephardic Jews named Emma Lazarus wrote a poem for the mother of exiles entitled, The New Colossus. My father, both of my mother's parents, were personally introduced to the mother of exiles when they came to this great nation. They were fleeing hatred, death, and religious persecution. I am a first-generation American. We are Jewish. My people are well acquainted with exile. During the last thousand years, most Jewish suffering has come at the hands of Christian people in Christian nations. When my grandfather escaped from Russia, it had already been a Christian nation for 900 years, boasting 54,457 Russian Christian churches. My father escaped from Catholic Hungary between the pogroms and the Nazis. 
I hope that no one will forget the statistic. 95% of the population of Nazi Germany considered themselves to be either Catholic or Protestant. It took a nation that was 95% Christian to destroy most of the Jews of Europe. Well, anyway, when, when my father reached our shores, he sailed into the harbor at Ellis Island and went past America's mother of exiles. This beautiful womanly vision of freedom is also known as the Statue of Liberty. The poem written by that Sephardic Jewish woman is inscribed on the bronze plaque at her feet. The words of that Jewish poet describe the mother of exiles, welcoming countless millions of immigrants who have fled from lands filled with untold horror. Emma Lazarus calls her a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. Cries she with silent lips, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. My family came through that golden door. I have enjoyed the blessing of freedom because my father came to these shores from a land where he was hated for no other reason than the fact that he was Jewish. America has granted us the right to believe as we wish. Therefore, I am a benefactor of the religious liberty spoken of by John Adams. This is the freedom promised in the Declaration of Independence, and it was purchased by the lives of those who fought to provide this liberty. It was a call to arms. Freedom was secured by fighting men and preserved by many brave souls of later generations, like my father, who proudly fought to protect the freedoms we cherish in this great land of liberty, where we are free at last. And when push comes to shove, and in such circumstances, not everyone agrees. Did you know that if the American Revolution had been waged by popular election instead of muskets, the war would have been lost? Most Americans were against our war for freedom. Can you imagine the talk around the water cooler back in 1776? So many Americans were opposed to our war for independence that without each precious supporter, I guess the war may have been lost. Some years ago, I was doing some research for a book that I was writing about the history of the Jewish people. Prior to that investigation, I had no idea how many Americans were against the war. Nor did I realize the magnitude of Jewish contributions that were made to the Revolutionary War effort. No one had ever told me about the Jewish patriots of the American Revolution or of the Jewish connection to American independence. I found the details to be fascinating. I knew that Thomas Jefferson was credited for writing our Declaration of Independence, but I had no idea he wrote it on the second floor of a home in Philadelphia on Market Street that was shortly thereafter converted into a store by two Jewish patriots, Simon and Hyman Gratz. America owes a great debt to this Jewish family. Their father, Michael Gratz, built and outfitted blockade runners on the Potomac River. His efforts enabled our troops to survive and continue the fight. His brother, Barnard Gratz, made sure that the soldiers of the Revolution had guns and ammunition to defend against the British. Another Jewish patriot, Joseph Simon, manufactured many of the rifles that won the war. They risked their lives and their families because they believed in the cause of freedom. I stumbled across this information as I researched and carefully documented how the Jews came to America. In the process, I learned about the Jewish involvement in the American Revolution. I also came to realize how unpopular this revolution was. The most important war in U.S. history did not have popular support. The highly revered American Revolution was not highly revered by all Americans. 
Actually, that great revolution which introduced democracy to the modern world was not a unified effort. John Adams is credited with reporting that only one-third of the colonials supported America's quest for independence from England. So you see, it's likely that two-thirds of the citizenry did not support the war effort. You know, the romanticized, I don't know, imaginative view of the American Revolution, passed down in revised fashion to glorify the American ethos, is simply not accurate. But it is important that you do know that many colonial Jews distinguished themselves in military service, commerce, shipping, civic service, and even in the politics of colonial America. Modern Jewish Americans should be very proud of the sacrifices made by early Jewish patriots. And this is particularly impressive when you realize that the Jews had experienced terrible anti-Semitism in early America. Did you know that it was illegal to be Jewish in parts of colonial America? Would you believe it was punishable by death? The famed Act of Toleration decreed the death penalty for Jews and atheists who denied the divinity of Jesus. The so-called Act of Toleration was not very tolerant. It is therefore quite remarkable and perhaps miraculous that America's early treatment of Jews did not deter its Jewish citizens from important patriotic service in support of the war effort. Without the help of great Jewish patriots, the 4th of July may have led to disaster. We should all thank God that America was successful. We won our liberty, and it is appropriate that we joyously celebrate that 4th of July, 1776, as the date our Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. However, the truth is that not a single signature was included on the document as of July 4th. That's a little known secret that few people will tell you, but I thought you might be interested. The truth is that on the 4th of July, 1776, the document did not yet have a single signature approving the Declaration. New York did not even vote on the resolution until later in July, and actually most of the final 56 signatures were not obtained or added to the document until August of 1776. Believe it or not, one man, Thomas McKean, did not actually sign his name until 1781. Nevertheless, on the 4th of July in 1776, America did let freedom ring, literally. For it was on that day in Philadelphia that the famous Liberty Bell rang loudly to announce the adoption of America's Declaration of Independence. I mentioned this symbol of freedom in a prior episode. It's engraved with the profound words from the Jewish Bible which declared, proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. The Liberty Bell was sounded every 4th of July until 1835 when it fell silent after it broke while ringing at the funeral of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall. Nevertheless, all Americans can be proud that in 1839, the Liberty Bell became a symbol for freedom-loving, slavery-hating citizens who vigorously worked to abolish slavery during the years leading up to America's Civil War. They knew that all men, black or white, Protestant, Catholic, Jew or atheist, all of us were created equal, and all Americans of any color were entitled to enjoy our God-given divine right of freedom. Today, the Liberty Bell is old, worn, and has a large scar running along its weathered side. Yet God's words inscribed on that bell continue to boldly announce, we are free at last. Most people are unaware that the famous Bible text on the Liberty Bell points to a particularly rare Yom Kippur celebration when the Jewish Day of Atonement would come during the year of Jubilee. Now, I, I love father-son motifs in scripture. They lead to legacy. These words remind us of another more important 
father-son story. The real story of independence cannot be complete without this Jewish connection to freedom. The words of Moses engraved on the Liberty Bell come from a powerful message of hope. It was given by Moses in the Torah. Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. These famous words point us to God's jubilee on the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Now, I detail the, the history and meaning of this biblical festival for both Christians and Jews in my book, God Forgive Me. But for today's purposes, you should understand that the Liberty Bell, it points to a particularly rare Yom Kippur celebration. This extra special Day of Atonement only came during the year of Jubilee. Did you know that in the year of Jubilee, all debts were to be forgiven? All lands were to be restored to the original owners, and all the slaves were to be set free. That was how God's people were to celebrate the Lord's Jubilee in the tremendous plan of God. He made provision for His children to be free, truly and totally free. During every 50th year, the economy was to enjoy a reset. All that had been lost was to be restored. And the biblical account from Moses causes us to remember the more famous father-son story that I promised to retell. You see, the Hebrew term for jubilee comes from the word yovel. It literally means trumpet and is identified as a ram's horn trumpet. The ram's horn, or shofar, is one of Judaism's most enduring symbols. It is heard during the Jewish high holidays, and it is our call to repentance, to worship, and to consider the mercy of God. However, it also warned us of the coming judgment by our God. The ram's horn harks back to a very famous section from the Torah called the Akidah. This is the Torah portion that is read during the Jewish High Holidays. In English, the Akidah is called the binding. It specifically describes the binding of Isaac in the Genesis account when God sent Abraham up to Mount Moriah to test his faith by commanding Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. This biblical milestone becomes a central theme for our Jewish High Holiday worship. It also has been embraced within Christianity as an important depiction of true faith, prefiguring the story of Jesus Christ. I believe it is a definitive father-son story. Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son to show his faith. He was willing and faithful. As a result, God sent a ram caught in the thicket as a replacement sacrifice. Hence, the ram's horn has become a wonderful symbol of faith and freedom. But it is our call to draw near to God and our most heralded alarm announcing the end of our Day of Atonement, the close of our revered Day of Judgment. How beautiful and interesting to know that within Christianity, that same sound, the blowing of the ram's horn trumpet, will likely be the sound of the last trumpet. That last trump heard at the return of Jesus, heralding the close of this age, announcing God's coming day of judgment. My belief is that when the saints go marching in, the Archangel Michael will be playing a ram's horn trumpet. And I'll even go out on a limb and say that it will probably be a horn from that miracle ram caught in the thicket when God spared the life of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Are you getting the picture? I see two important father-son stories tying all of this together and both leading to freedom. Both of these father-son stories symbolically declare our liberty and both of these father-son stories were well understood by the founding fathers of America. However, sadly, it seems that today Neither of these stories seem well understood in modern culture. In closing, I want you to think about the simple truth. God saved Abraham's son Isaac by sending a ram 
to take his place as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. But he spared not his own son when he sent him as the Passover lamb on Mount Calvary. I hope you can make this important connection. And I hope you can embrace the eternal plan of God. Hey guys, thank you for watching. Uh, please remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and press that bell so we'll be notified.